complementary aspects of who he is. And we're trying, Mark and I, and uh, we're trying to figure out also how we are going to be working together in the future. And this is one of the ways, using, uh, using the work that we've developed over the years to bring it together with what Mark uh, and Don are developing here, what Don has helped us develop, and to see how we can transform the process of education in different settings. Now, I'm going to talk uh, some this evening about this journey, this, getting, this process of getting unstuck. And I'm going to talk some about it, and I'm going to give you a little bit of an experience, I hope, of some of what I'm talking about. And then I hope we'll have a chance to have a dialogue, a little bit of dialogue back and forth here. And then we'll have, uh, as Lois said, we'll some chance afterwards. I'll be sitting outside for a while and, and sign books and we can talk some more. And I emphasize the process of dialogue because the work and the play that we do at the Center for Mind Body Medicine and that being stuck is about, is about that experience of self-discovery. And part of the experience of discovering ourselves is becoming aware of who we are in relation to one another, how we are with each other. One of the very interesting aspects, one of the many very interesting aspects of the New Testament, of course, is that conscious emphasis on two or more people being together. And out of that fellowship, out of that community, a truth arises that is different from the one that comes from one person. And that's very much part of the spirit of the work that we do at the Center for Mind Body Medicine. Two of my colleagues from the Center are here. Uh, Amy Schimmel, who's our, why don't you wave your hand around, who's our clinical director, and Tina Linden, who, uh, really manage all of our international programs, all the programs that we have in war and post-war situations for 10 years. Uh, and so then you might want to talk about that. Tina, raise your hand too, so people can. Because this, if you want to find out, a number of you have asked me questions about the work of the center. You can find out from me, but you can find out from all of us. And of course, you can find out from Don uh, as well. And there are also people, this is very interesting, people from other parts of my life. When I was working with runaway and homeless kids in Washington, D.C., and working in St. Elizabeth's Hospital. So it's, it's quite amazing to sort of have that sense of, of connection. And as I think about it, I realize how much each stage of my life has helped to give birth to the next one and has helped to inform the next one. So reading, uh, reading Unstuck, I'm sure any of you who knew me 30 or more years ago can see uh, echoes uh, of what I was doing then. Now, the important thing about this notion of understanding our experience as part of a journey and understanding that the troubles that befall us, which are often named by medical experts, major depressive disorder, or post-traumatic stress disorder, or anxiety disorder, that these are not, and I repeat, are not primarily to be seen, as far as I'm concerned, as the end product of a pathological process, as diseases. These are human experiences and are, and it makes a difference in how you understand what's going on with you. If you understand it's a disease, you're going to relate to it one way, likely with Western medical means, drugs, surgery. That's the Western medical paradigm. If you understand what you're going through as part of a journey of growth, and transformation and a growth in consciousness, you're going to approach it very differently. And you're going to approach it with many of the techniques and with, but even more important than the techniques,
peace with a sense of wonder and of possibility. That doesn't mean that these situations that we go through in our lives aren't painful. They're excruciatingly painful or can be. But we have everything to gain from looking at them as potential teachers for us as well as occasions for pain. And we have nothing to lose. It's like some of you may remember from philosophy, Pascal's wager. Remember Pascal Blaise, Pascal, the French philosopher who was also um, the, uh, is revered by gamblers because he was the founder of probability theory. But Pascal essentially said, if you believe in the existence of God and you act accordingly, you have uh, everything to gain and nothing, really, to lose. On the other hand, if you don't believe in God and act accordingly, if God doesn't exist, well, you haven't lived a very, you know, particularly moral life, and if he does exist, he might just be in big trouble. <laughs> now, I take that out of that particular religious context, and I see it as if you look at the difficulties that come to you, if we do, not you, me, I'm part of this too, if all of us look at those difficulties as potentially part of our transformation, part of the growth of our consciousness, we have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Now that doesn't mean we may not use a variety of other methods to help ourselves, a variety of methods, including methods that balance our biology. But those methods don't have to be methods that cause problems. So for example, and we'll look at a few slides I think. Um, an expert, the definition of an expert? An expert is somebody who comes from 200 miles away and has slides. <laughs> I only come from about 20 miles away, so I don't know what that makes me. But, so we'll show some slides. And all the references that will be up there are references that are, that are in Unstuck. So for the price of Unstuck, you can have all, everything on the slides and a lot more. The, the point is that it is possible for those of us who are going through serious periods of anxiety, or depression, or post-traumatic stress disorder, or just feeling kind of confused, it is possible to work on ourselves biologically without using drugs. And all the approaches that we're going to talk about this evening, that we're going to, some of which we'll experience, can change our biology in ways that are positive, can help to balance out the imbalances that we have with no negative side effects and only positive side benefits. So we're going to start with one that we always do in our trainings, in our groups, and that I often do when I'm working with people individually as well. That is, we're going to simply sit quietly and do a relaxation or meditation technique with the highly esoteric name <coughs> soft belly. So sit comfortably. <laughs> Allow your breathing to deepen. If you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes. It's helpful to remove distraction. Please come sit. And as you come sit, you can breathe slowly, walk slowly, enjoy the walk. That's it. Breathing deeply. Now begin breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. very relaxing way to breathe. It may be a little unfamiliar to some of you. You get the hang of it. 
happen after a bit. Allow your belly to be soft. To encourage this process, you can say to yourself, soft, as you breathe in, and belly, as you breathe out. Open your eyes, bring your attention back to the Anybody notice any change? Let me raise your hand. Any change at all in these three, four minutes of reading? Great. What, what was the change? Speak it, shout it out. What change? Calm. Calm. Slower breath. I'm sorry? Slower breath. What else? Ease of mind. Ease of mind. Ease of mind. That's nice. Great. Yes? My eyes are open and it looks like the color changed up there. Okay. Great. Thank you. So, for me, sometimes things are quieter, things are a little clearer. This is very important to do <coughs> before you have something to do, when you're rushing through a bunch of tasks and you need to come and you need to be focused on what you're doing, which hopefully is most of the time. It's really nice just to take a minute or two and breathe deeply like this because it brings you into the moment in a relaxed way. How many people feel a little more present? Anybody want to? Yeah, good, beautiful. That's what, that's what we're here for, right? To be present. This is our life, our lives. So we might as well be present for them. So this 
simple technique is the basis, in a way, for all of mind-body medicine, or can be seen that way. Mind-body medicine is a big, sort of big name, um, but it's really very simple. And the basic idea is that everything that happens to us affects our mind and our body. Everything that goes on in the body affects the mind, as well as affecting itself. Everything that affects the mind affects the body. That's the basic science, which you can spend quite a bit of time studying. And perhaps this afternoon, Esther Sternberg or others talked about that. The important practical thing is that we can be part of this ongoing interaction, ongoing conversation between the mind and the body. And we can change the nature of that conversation, the tenor of the voices in that conversation. So we can go from being shrill to being kind of calm and quiet. We can get a little perspective on those things that are agitating us. We can quiet the body, it may be tense. And that capacity is there in everyone who's sitting here, and indeed everyone on the planet just has that capacity. It's very simple, very inexpensive. Uh, talk about healthcare crisis, we're talking a lot about um, healthcare crisis these days. If everyone were using the simple techniques of self-care, I'm sure the panel talked about that some this afternoon, we would not only go a long way to preventing and treating chronic illness, we would go a long way to solving the financial dilemmas that accompany our healthcare crisis. Very simple. So this one technique is a relaxation technique. It, if you do it on a regular basis, it will decrease levels of anxiety, it will lower blood pressure, it will um, slow heart rate, slow breathing, decrease muscle tension, increase the synchrony between the two halves of the brain, decrease frequency and intensity of epileptic seizures, and increase fertility in chronically infertile women, among other things. One technique. Because what it's doing is it's balancing systems, organisms, humans, like us, who are out of balance, who are too often in a kind of fight or flight mode, anxious, tense, anticipating difficulties or catastrophes. We're thinking about the ones that happened yesterday or the day before. What this does is this is the antidote. It's a relaxation technique. It is also a meditation technique. Most of you probably know this, but just in case you don't, you don't have to join a group, you know, or put on a uniform, or go to the Himalayas, uh, or give up your religion to do meditation. Meditation is part of every religious and spiritual tradition in the world. And you can do it while you practice whatever tradition it is you come from and integrate this change in consciousness into whatever you're doing in, this, in your tradition. Or you can move in the direction of another tradition, but that's up to you. But meditation is there for you to use. It's your friend, it's your servant, it's your birthright. This kind of meditation, soft belly, is technically a concentrated meditation. We're concentrating on the breath, on the words soft and belly, and on the feeling of the belly relaxing. Everybody with me? If you don't understand, you know, raise your hand or jump up and down. I'll do my best to explain. This is a concentrated meditation. It, again, every tradition that I know of has concentrated meditations. In the monotheistic religions, we have repetitive prayers, and in many other religions too, that are concentrated meditations. Hail Mary, full of grace, Shema Yisrael, Illallah, Illallah. All those 
are also concentrative meditations, concentrating on the name of God, concentrating on Mary, concentrating on something that will enhance us spiritually. There are two other kinds of meditation. Awareness or mindfulness meditation, becoming aware of thoughts, feelings, and sensations as they arise. And the third kind, which I think we'll do a little bit later on, is expressive meditation, which is the oldest kind on the planet. Moving the body, chanting, jumping up and down, and shouting for it. So it's a meditation. It's also a form of guided imagery. I gave you an image. The image was soft belly. I guided you in using that image. So you say, I don't know, I've never used guided imagery. We've now used guided imagery. Everybody in this room who sat here and did salt belly for a few minutes was also using guided imagery. You were also using self-hypnosis. You were giving yourself, hypnosis is relaxation, focusing, and intention. So you were relaxing. You were focusing on the soft belly, and the intention was to breathe deeply and let the belly be soft. You were giving yourself suggestion. So this one technique can be the basis for learning, and by learning I mean primarily experiencing what mind-body medicine is all about, and is the doorway, or can be the doorway, to all these other approaches that we may have wondered about or heard about or perhaps practiced. The other thing that's important in the context of getting unstuck is that it is crucial to have a way to relax. There are many ways of getting unstuck, and we'll talk about some others. But this is absolutely crucial because so often the place where we're stuck, that is the place where we're constantly repeating ourselves, psychobiologically, is agitation and anxiety. This is, a, this is a whole nation of, and especially the Washington, D.C. area, of people in anxious overdrive. Now, it's not, I was just in L.A., it's not quite as bad. In L.A., everybody's supposed to be laid back until they get on the freeway. <laughs> I was driving out here, and I was a, a ridiculous amount of traffic. You see out here. But at least people weren't ready to murder each other. I was in LA and my goddaughter and I were driving and we had to move over a lane to get to get to an exit. Uh, and you know, I signaled and wasn't going too fast, I didn't cut anybody off. But when I looked at the rear view mirror, there was a woman going, <laughs>
those people who have difficulty dealing with stress and put themselves under stress are much more likely to have chronic illness of every kind. It's estimated by, this is by sort of medical, sort of mainstream medicine, that at least 80% of visits to primary care are related to stress. At least 80%. So this is, the, this is the key to beginning to deal with the stress that produces most of the chronic illnesses we have. Directly and indirectly. Stress raises blood sugar. Stress raises cholesterol. Stress raises blood pressure. So right there, you have the makings of heart disease, right? The makings of type 2 diabetes. You begin to deal with stress, health will improve significantly. So, any questions at this point? If you have a question, please feel free. Yeah, Don. When you say stress, you also mean to say a student here who is basically worried about their grades. Yes. Is that also the stress? Yes. This, this is. I don't know about Mason firsthand, but I know about Georgetown Medical School where I teach. And a major, first of all, you have to identify what the stress is. Because it may be slightly different for each student. When I ask medical students, we have, we have mind-body skill students for medical students at Georgetown and at 15 U.S. medical schools. So Hopkins, Duke, Stanford, a bunch of others. When you ask medical students, um, you know, why they decide to join the group, they often say, I'm stressed out. And then the next question is, well, what's stressing me? They look at me like I'm crazy. They say, what do you mean? I'm a medical student. Of course I'm stressed. I said, uh oh. What's stressing you in particular? And there are many different answers. <coughs> One of the answers is, I should be doing better than I'm doing. Or my roommate is doing better. You don't be surprised, or maybe not, at how often that happens. My roommate does so much better than I do. I can't stand it. Or I'm supposed to be in the top 10% of my class, and I'm not. So that all of those variations are part of it. But sometimes it's something very different. It's my girlfriend lives 500 miles away. I'm not sure if our relationship's going to last. I don't know if I want to become a dog. I feel lonely in Washington, D.C. I'm worried about my father and my mother. So all these different things. So if you spend time with students, incidentally, students are obviously under stress. There's a, there was a survey done. Uh, and I've seen two figures. One of them is uh, minimally unbelievable. The other is totally unbelievable. But they're from reputable sources. But I'll just quote the lower one. It is that 25% of college freshmen are on antidepressant drugs. That's mind-boggling. I've spoken at some universities, and I think people have told me that, or more. And a lot of it is competitiveness. So I don't fit in. I don't know what to do. Occasionally, maybe they'll get the eye. Um, they don't get you very high. Uh, but mostly it's that answer, I can't sleep. I would say in medical school, 70% of the students don't sleep well. There were some surveys. In college, I don't know what it is, but, but it's, it's significant. So yes, there's a real issue here, and a real reason, Mark, for us to talk about how to provide mind-body skills groups to the community. Because it really makes a difference to, to be able to offer people kinds of techniques so that they can, because the difference between breathing deeply and taking a Xanax uh, is considerable. Breathing deeply feels good, but it's not addictive. Uh, it doesn't ruin your life, doesn't, you don't have withdrawal symptoms when you stop, uh, doesn't cost anything. But beyond that, you're doing it yourself. You have a sense of authority and a sense of power sense of capability. Whereas if you just take a pill, 
then the pill is doing it, and you're not taking it. So even if you are taking pills, it's important to be doing other things for yourself. It doesn't have to be either or, but the first way, if possible, should be a way that doesn't have negative side effects. If that doesn't work, or if you need something else, then it's fine, then okay. But it's crucial throughout, and this is very crucial I mean, for, for people of all ages, uh, and I would say particularly for young people, people who are going to college, younger kids, uh, and it's also true for older people, that you have a sense that you can do something for yourself, either when you're just starting out, or when you feel like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't have the strength I used to, I can't do what I used to, to see that there are still things that you can do. It's really important. Any other questions or comments? Okay, let me show you a few slides. Uh, I've already said this, it's the beginning of the journey. I love that image of the journey. <coughs> Very dignified. Exciting, adventurous to be on the journey. It's not so dignified, exciting, or adventurous to be a patient. It's okay, you have to be, but when you don't have to be, why not understand yourself as being on the journey of your life? This is the way humans have understood for a very long time our experience, our life experience, the journey with different stages. about relaxation. The first stage, I'm going to go through the stages so you can get a, a sense of what I'm talking about. These are stages that uh, originally, the idea of these stages is very, very old, millennia old, but began to be codified in modern times by Carl Jung, the psychiatrist, and then by Joseph Campbell, the pathologist. And I, 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 I modified them somewhat to sort of suit the, uh, some of the points I'm making and some of the prescriptions that I'm offering. But basically, this is the pattern. And this is the pattern that the great heroes, male and female, heroes, and as a friend of mine says, and heroes, heroes and heroes, have experienced. This is the pattern in scripture. This is the pattern in myth. This is a pattern in cultures throughout the world if you hear the stories of different cultures. And the stages are very similar, and these are the stages of healing, not just from depression, but from all of the ills that beset us. Now, the first is the call. You have to know that something is going on to want to do something about it. If you're going to leave the house, and go on your journey, there's got to be a reason. Something's got, there's got to be something to stir it. But one of the ways, and it's amazing, or perhaps not, how so often, so many of us don't pay attention. Our lives have come to a standstill. The title of my book, Unstuck, comes because so many people have said to me, I feel stuck. So we're stuck, but we really don't know what's going on. We don't know why. We don't know what to do about it. We don't know if there's anything to do. And we want to very often pretend that it's not happening. And we're a culture that often shoves things under the rug. Uh, how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. I don't know if you can see me. I'm sure you've seen you know, that somebody tells you he or she is fine, and then they're gritting their teeth. There's a smile there, and they're not. You can feel <coughs> that they're not fine, but they have to present that face to the world, and often enough to themselves. Everything's okay. I'm, you know, having six scotches every night, and uh, I can't get to sleep anyway. Not getting along with anybody, but it's all okay. So it's not okay. But we have to take a little bit of time to pay attention to what's going on. We have to ask ourselves a simple question. Uh, somebody 
somebody comes along and says, how are you doing? Instead of just responding, fine, um, you need to ask yourself, how am I doing? Sick quietly, do soft belly. What's going on? How am I? And then the answers will start to come. If you just take a little time, we're in such a rush all the time. So busy. And then, once we say something, something's out of balance, something's out of balance, what is it? What's going on right now? What are the things that are troubling me? So you just take a little inventory. Oh, for me, I'm a little tired. These, these are bothering me. That's about it right now. But maybe at other times as much more. What's going on? And then the second question, you can write the answers to these down. It's very helpful. My suggestion is to do salt belly for five, ten minutes and then ask yourself the question. The second question is, where do I want to get to? What change do I want to make? Well, I want to be able to run with my children. So I got to do something about my knees. I mean, I, this has been apparent to me for a while. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing something. Uh, so where do I want to get to? Uh, I want, I think I should get more sleep. So I do need to pay attention to my schedule. <laughs> I need to, to figure out how to do it. So what are the specifics? And then that's the third one. Second is where do I want to get to? I want to get to a place where I regularly have more sleep. I want to get to a place where my knees are functioning better. What are the steps? Well, the steps for my knees, and this became clear to me after resisting it, with all that I've been we all forget. We all don't want to hear the call at times. Uh, about, for about two or three years, it's been in my mind, you have to start doing Tai Chi. You know Tai Chi? Moving meditation, Chinese moving meditation. Uh, but it wasn't until nine months or a year ago that I started doing Tai Chi. Tai Chi is good for my knees. So I heard the call, that's the first step. Start doing Tai Chi every morning. Do what you know. Do what I, I do what I do. What about sleep? What's the first step on the way to sleep? Now that I've realized that I have to do it. Well, the first step is to not, which I actually have done, to not schedule something the first night that I come, uh, when I'm traveling three, five thousand miles, wherever I'm traveling, to not schedule something right away. So I have some time to sleep. So very simple. So that's the call. That's the beginning. Something is out of balance. Physically, psychologically, <coughs> spiritually, interpersonally. What is it? Oh, my wife and I aren't talking to each other anymore. Oh, okay, that's something you may, have, you may have gotten used to that. But now, when you're paying attention to the call, it's like, that's a bit strange that we don't do anything more than say hello and goodbye to each other. But you'd be surprised, or perhaps not, how many couples it comes to something like that. So, and it takes something to wake, wake us up. So that's the call. Second is meeting guides. Not everybody needs someone to, uh, to be a guide. I use the word guide. In our culture, most guides are therapists. We call them therapists. As therapy has to do with healing. Report. Could be a physician, could be a psychologist, a social worker, a hospital counselor, a nurse, somebody who's working as a Therapist. That person is a professional guy. When we're really in trouble, it's very important to have a guy. One of the great difficulties we have, except for isolated places like uh, uh, Manhattan, Beverly Hills, maybe, uh, it's not very fashionable to see a therapist. It's kind of uh, your week. What's the matter? Why are you doing that? What's, what's the problem? And, and I think that this is, this is really too bad and, and, and sometimes tragic. Because as I got ready, as I was writing on the stuff and I was looking at the 
world's literature, one of the things I realized yet again is that the greatest heroes in our Western tradition have people who were there as guides for them. Odysseus was my boyhood hero, wily Odysseus. Right? He, he always got into trouble and he always got out of trouble. But he always had a guide, he always had Athena, the goddess of wisdom. She was always there for him, every step of the way. Then he had a few others. And incidentally, most of them were women. A couple of men in there, but mostly women. It's very interesting in a Greek culture that is very, if you will, fallow centered, <coughs> very male centered. But his guys were women. Socrates, the wisest man of his time, and generally regarded as the wisest man in, uh, in our culture. He had two major sources of guidance. The first was from within, from what he called his daimon, the A-I-M-O-N, and we'll come to it a little bit later. But that's the wisdom, the soul, the genius that's in each person. That we can go inside contact with techniques like meditation and guided energy. So that's one. And the other was the Sybil, the oracle, the wise woman, the witch. When his inner guidance wasn't enough, he'd go to her and he'd say, I'm at a loss. I need your help. So these are the wiliest, the cleverest, one of the greatest sort of warrior, uh, intelligences of our history. Odysseus, the wisest man, arguably, of our tradition, Socrates, both have guides. We need to come to that. And we need also to understand that aboriginal in our tradition, all of us, all of our aboriginal ancestors, all of our aboriginal brothers and sisters, this sense of having someone there for you is built into the culture. If you have a small problem, you go to see your granny, your grandma, or somebody else's grandma. She has the basic first aid healing techniques. So if you were you have a cut, or you have a cold, or you have an asthma, or you have a you have a stiff arm or something where you have some depression or anxiety, it's not too bad, you go see your grandma. If it's a major problem, life-threatening illness, serious depression, psychosis, you go see the official healer, the shaman, the wise man, the wise woman, the witch doctor of the society. And that person serves as your guide, and that person also assembles others who can be there with you on your journey. Sometimes a small group, sometimes a large group. So guidance is crucial. And we may well need to find a guide as we take this on this doctrine. And we need to make sure that somebody who knows what she or he is doing experiential, clinical sense, they've had the training, but we also, and here again is a place where we don't often really pay enough attention, it also has to be somebody to whom we feel connected, who's right for us. So that's something you have to check out as you're looking for the outer guide, you have to check it out with your inner guide. Is this the right person? The third stage, of the jury, and also other people can be guides. You don't need just a professional guide. One of the things that happens, one of the things I suggest you do, is when you're going through a difficult time, or perhaps any time, is to open yourself to the guides who arise spontaneously in your life. It may be totally unexpected, totally unlikely. But they may be there for us. You'll know, not there, they're not necessarily people who are telling us what to do. Those are some of the people you may want to steer clear of. They're the people who you feel are really present for you and who by their very being, 
may teach you something. It may be the person who, you know, when you're going through a period of utter confusion, invites you over to dinner. You just sit there and you feel at peace in that person's house. That's enormously helpful. It may be a member of the family who comes to your mind, not the ones you usually hang out with, perhaps, but someone you haven't thought about in years, and she pops into your mind. She may be, she may be the person who can help you in the next stage of your Yes, please. How often is the guy dead, not passed on? Homer, is he a guy? Sorry, who? Is the guy passed on, an author? Homer, is Homer a guy for you? Homer. Um, Homer, the author, or the, the singer of the Odyssey and the Iliad. Um, you know, I don't think of him. I haven't thought of him as my guy. I have thought of the, the Odyssey. I feel like Odysseus is Yes, at times, yes, now that you mention it. At times, those texts provide guidance for me. So thank you for saying that. And so I will read them. One of the things I find is, if you, how many of you have the experience, you're going through something, you go into a bookstore, and you're drawn to a particular book? Just want to say that. That, that turns out to be helpful to you. So yeah, sometimes I'll say, I've got to look at the Odyssey, or I've got to look at the Iliad. But it's not so much a, you know, like, now I've got to consult Homer. It's more like a feeling that comes up. So yes, books are beautiful for guidance. So Homer, Dante, the Bible, St. Francis, uh, many different, William Butler Yates, many different texts at different times. And sometimes not such, just something, sometimes it's a movie. How many of you, again, have, Turned on a movie or seen a movie on an airplane that was, it was like it was made just for you when you're going through a difficult time. Me too. So that, yes, those are sources of guidance. Thank you. Yes. Sometimes it's good to be miserable because it makes you, fires you up, makes you 
do things you wouldn't otherwise do. But most of us can't just surrender to life. We need some, to put out some energy to do something. One of the best techniques is one that not only puts out energy, but that also shakes up the fixed structure of our thought, of our feeling, of our physiological function. Chronic illness is basically maladaptive, repetitive physiological patterns. Blood pressure too high, right? Just keeps reinforcing itself. Depression, you're stuck. You can't move. Uh, repetitive thoughts, self-defeating ideas, always negative, the future looks dark. Anxiety or post-traumatic stress disorder, you're in a state of anxiety. It's like the event, the traumatic event is being replayed in your body continually. Some of you have if not experienced it, perhaps you've worked with or met people, many of the people coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan when we work with our set or in this state. They're stuck. It's as if the past, these chronic, repetitive, destructive patterns have a hold on them. And the best way to break up these patterns is to shake them up. And the simplest way to shake them up is to shake the body. Now, I'm, I'm very glad we're at a university because this takes a great deal of learning to understand this technique. <laughs> but I, so I'm going to show you, and I think, let's see, let's see how it goes. This is shaking like this. You put your feet shoulder width, bend your knees a little, and you shake your body. All right, this is very good. Very good. Okay, we're going to come back to this. That's the first phase, shaking. The second phase is just relaxing and becoming aware of our bodies and our breath. <clears throat> and then the third phase is allowing our bones to move. Now, I would say dance, except if I say dance, it's going to Put an idea in your head. It's foxtrot, it's samba, it's salsa, it's electric slide. And the dance that's most important, those are fine, but the dance that's most important is the dance that you want your body, your being wants and needs to do. Now, if there are 80 or 100 people in this room, there are going to be 80 or 100 different dances. We're all unique. It's another important part of this journey, is that as we go on it, each of us is going to have somewhat different experiences. The stages may be similar, but each of us has a unique experience. If we're out of balance, each is out of balance in a unique way. Similarly, each of us needs to move in a way that's special. So three stages, because he had that sense, this is what I want to do. And his songs are wonderful, and they're wonderful about dealing with opposition. Opposition will come your way in this song. The harder they come, the harder they fall one and all. Beautiful. Just the indomitable spirit. So what was it like for you? Anyone want to share an experience? Great, okay. That's good. <laughs> you can't be tense when you're moving like that. It really will please you. Yes. Physically, emotionally, or both? Both. Both. It yes. Clears your mind, clears your body, and kind of moves you in a different direction. Anybody have major trouble? It's good to hear about troubles. It's a challenge to do it on this slope floor. <laughs> yes, that's true. It is a challenge. This is a beautiful way to begin the day. We did it five, six minutes of shaking, a couple minutes of quiet, and three minutes or so of dancing. You can increase the time as you go on. It's a wonderful way to get, how many people feel a little more energized? I am. It's all at 8.30 at night, and your energy starting to come up. <laughs> Now, 
Now, you don't want to do this at 11 o'clock at night and then you can't sleep. Great to do early in the morning. It's great to do at the end of a work day. Let go of all that stress and strain at work. You're shaking and dancing on your front lawn. <laughs> you walk in the house. I used to live in the country. And uh, I actually, I used to do another kind of uh, active meditation, very fast deep breathing like this. And I used to do it for 40 minutes. Yeah, I lived in this little house, farmhouse out in the country. And uh, one, sometimes when I would do it, cows would come around. But another time I was doing it not in the pasture, but in the yard. And I, I, heard, I heard a car and I heard a loud noise. But I, I wasn't paying, you know, I was busy. Didn't know with my eyes. It turned out it was uh, the deputy sheriff. <laughs> and he had no idea what was happening. He crashed into our porch with his sheriff's car. <laughs> so pick a spot to do it where you're not going to get in any particular trouble. Uh, have a little time for yourself. Set aside some time. It's part of this journey. You're saying, okay, I need to set aside some time for myself. This is an expressive meditation. You have just done an expressive meditation. Expressive means you're working with the body. You're expressing, you're getting it out. You've done a concentrative meditation and an expressive meditation. You can also, sometimes you may not feel like shaking, just put on music and move in the morning. How many of you have had the thought sometime in the last six months, you know, it might be good if I dance a little more? How many? Just curious. So look, look around, a bunch of people. And yet, most of us, what do we do with that thought? Oh, yeah, maybe sometime. Maybe I'll go to a party. Maybe I'll go to a club. Uh, it's not happening right now. Why should I dance? All these things come up, but that's that's the call. It's telling us, it's saying, okay, baby, it's time to move that body. So if you're going to dance, put on music that moves you, and understand that how powerful the music and perhaps especially the words can be. How deeply they go, because the more you do it, the deeper into your being the words go. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because you get into a state where you're more open, more receptive. So the words should be words that are truly inspiring, or perhaps cathartic. I've had several people I've known who were particularly uh, angry at their women, who were particularly angry at their male partners, or sometimes female partners, and the song that they liked preferentially was, You're So Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes if you're angry, uh, I used to I used to do it to you can't always get what you want. <laughs> but whatever it is, this the Jimmy Cliff song is very upbeat, very inspirational. That's what I prefer to. Yes. Do you find that people's choice of music changes as they go through some of the sure. some of the stages, so that sure. Doesn't yours? Doesn't mine? Yeah, certainly. But I mean, do you notice it as a particular pattern? As people begin to move out of the depression and into the different stages, you know, yes and no. You mean do they do they give up uh, heavy metal for recording chants? <laughs> <laughs> but might they might they be choosing music that's um, more relaxing
Emotions are not the problem. It's when we get stuck in an emotion. So that's why you can use music to help you feel the emotion and move through it. How many have had the experience of being sad and of crying and feeling relief? Just for example. Yeah. Or being angry and, you know, giving it out. Not necessarily on your little child, but, you know, sometimes that has to happen too. Sometimes you have to get angry. It's authentic. And then it goes. It's different from hostility. Hostility is terrible. Holding it inside. Resentful. I wish, you know, I can't do this. I hate this job. I hate my boss. But I can't tell them if I get fired. And just holding it inside. That is, incidentally, not only a major contributor to depression uh, and to sort of unpleasant ways of acting, it is a major contributor to heart disease. That, that feeling of hostility, a lot of studies have been done. There's nothing wrong with anger as long as it's not festering, as long as it's not indulged. If it just comes and it goes, it's gone. My son, I get angry at him. I, 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 I even still, I'm worried. Oh, you know, that I get too angry. Two minutes later, it's, oh, Dad, I can't wait till we do this. I can't wait, because it's gone. I'm no longer angry. If I hold it in, and I'm irritated all the time, then we're in trouble. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So when you have these emotions, let them come. Experience them. Let them be, become aware of them. Let them be there. You can let them go with techniques like shaking and dancing. Hitting a pounding pillows or hitting a punching bag, so simple, but very effective in terms of dealing with frustration, dealing with anger. Physical exercise, incidentally, with the single exception of talking with another human being who is trained to do that and who's actually a compassionate person. Some people are trained but not compassionate. Talking with a compassionate human being may well be the best um, response, best therapy for depression, but physical exercise is very close. There have been studies done showing that physical exercise changes um, brain physiology. You can look at it on some of the scans of the brains. It increases the neurotransmitters that antidepressant drugs are trying to increase, like serotonin and norepinephrine. Plus, it releases endorphins, sort of our own internal morphine-like substance. And it does it with no side effects. Why would you go to the drug if you can do the same thing with the exercise? If the exercise is not enough, then you may need to use something else. But the point is, we have this incredible capacity, and physical exercise is or should be a major part of everybody's therapy for anxiety, for depression, but for living. Our ancestors, how many of you have spent any time with an Aboriginal tribe or sort of, sort of non-industrialized agriculturists? Anybody? If you have the opportunity, do it. Isn't it? It's an education. The way they live is so different from the way we live. First of all, they're moving most of the time. Most of our days, for most of us, are spent in a sedentary way. If you look at Aboriginal people or agriculturists, sort of early agriculturists, they are moving all the time. They're bending and walking and carrying, lifting, stretching, doing all these things four, six, eight hours a day. That's what we're genetically programmed to do. Our genes have not changed last 25, 40,000 years. So we need to do that just to be moderately healthy. We need to be moving around and moving our moments. And certainly if we're anxious or depressed, or if we have any kind of chronic physical problem. Exercise also good for inflammation. You have an inflammatory in the So exercise is crucial needs to be incorporated into our lives. And you don't have to go to the gym to do it. You don't, you don't 
in money maker. Go for a walk. Put on some music and dance. Very simple. Building up muscles does not necessarily bring health. It's not bad. Not bad exercise. It's just, you know, okay. okay. But so is walking. So is dancing. So is swimming. So is skipping.
you understand what I'm saying? So you only use substances which have side effects if you have to use them, and that's fine. But you begin with those substances, those treatments, those approaches, those interactions that have no downside. Hippocrates picked the first to no harm. And if we reverse them, if we use drugs and surgery only when they were necessary, and we use self-care as primary, and use approaches that you need a professional for, but that maximize your own healing, like acupuncture, you don't want to start saying the needles in yourself. Um, that's the way we should be going. Okay. The point, and I'm going to, I'm going to close in two, literally two minutes, uh, but I just want to say 30 seconds each of them. The difficulties you have in your greatest teachers, you have to inquire about them. Why are you here? Why am I so irritable? Have a dialogue. We do this in our programs. Have a dialogue between yourself and your symptom or your problem or your issue. It will tell you. In Unstuck, I go through this in some detail so you can read it, do it at home. It's extraordinary the information you get about, not only about why you're having problems, but about what to do about it. When you're feeling in despair, <coughs> the dark night of the soul, it's a term from John the Cross, 16th century Spanish monk. When you're feeling in despair, lack of hope, First thing to remember, and this is one of the reasons I like this dark night of the soul's name, is that it is likely to change just the way the darkest part of the night would yield today. If we can allow it and have that hope that it may happen. And it is crucial for most people. John of the Cross made it by his belief and faith in God, which was sort of challenged. Many of us need, most of us need human being. It's very important to have somebody there. For those of you who are health professionals, I was saying this the other day in one of our training programs at the Center for Mind Body Medicine. Uh, it's so crucial to be there for somebody when they're in big trouble. And when you are in big trouble, and to be there and then consistently there. It makes a difference. We sometimes think, oh, therapists are interchangeable. No. You know, one person does the intake, there's one they get referred to, almost nobody goes. You go to a clinic, you refer, 50% of the people go, maybe less, maybe 30, the military, 20% go. They don't do it. But if you connect with someone, you want to stay connected. So that's really important in the dark. Two things. If you can get through it, in the dark night of the soul, we don't realize there are options. Almost always are, almost always, always. And it is really important to have somebody else. Sixth stage, that we sometimes come to toward the end, but that the whole journey is about the spirituality. This experience is a spiritual experience. This is not about, well, certainly not just about relieving symptoms. This is about transforming the being, becoming through our difficulties, the person we were meant to be. This is about consciousness and transformation. So if this understanding is there from the beginning, it changes the nature of the experience of depression or anxiety or poverty. Also, spirituality is manifest every moment we're aware. It's how we are with each other every moment. That's are we loving? Or are we fearful and do we shut off? Do we stick with resentment? Do we let it go and open ourselves? Do we come into the moment and be present? Or do we retreat and preoccupy ourselves? These are all, every step of the journey, there are spiritual opportunities. And finally, Journey comes to a close, we start again. But the return 
means coming back to yourself, means seeing. It's a phrase that's often used in the world, the spiritual movement, seeing with new eyes. Understanding that that priceless jewel that you traveled 9,000 miles and suffered endless hardships for was actually sitting on your windowsill. That your beloved, whom you went and experimented with 6,000 people in 40 countries, but your beloved was actually next door. Sometimes actually, sometimes metaphorically. That is, meaning we come back to ourselves and we see the extraordinary beauty, we feel the extraordinary wonder in every ordinary situation in our lives. So I'm going to stop for now. Thank you very much. For that.